Hey there everyone, it's Mr. Lane. In this lecture, we will discuss the High Renaissance and Mannerism from the 1500s to 1600s. Take good notes and let's begin. Key ideas include symmetry, balance, ideal proportions, and triangular compositions. Venetian painters stress sensuous forms with sophisticated color combos. Portraits are of true likeness and personalities. The Roman grandeur was concerned with all inspiring art projects. And finally, there was a revitalization of the city of Rome under Pope Julius II. The most common and important patron of art during this period is the Catholic Church. Here's a list of key terms. These are all of the artworks we will analyze. Here's a map of Rome with Renaissance and Baroque monuments. Our first stop will be the Vatican City, where we will look at the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo, interior and ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Pope Julius II commissioned the frescoes in 1508. The subjects include Old Testament scenes from the Bible and it has over 300 figures. One of the figures is the Delphic Sibyl. If you look at the form and the muscles, it can be described as sculpturesque. They are located between the triangular areas that include the Old Testament prophets and pagan sibyls. The humanists claim that the Sibyls foretold the coming of a savior. This is a layout of the Sistine Chapel ceiling with all the stories and the characters and where they're located. Here's a link to a virtual tour and documentary about the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Here are three Renaissance masters. We have Leonardo da Vinci, who is a superb master of line, pioneer of spumato, inventor, a naturalist, and painter of the soul's intent. Raphael was a younger master painter who incorporated elements of Leonardo and Michelangelo into his own style. And finally, Michelangelo was the master of sculpture, also an excellent painter and architect, the man in demand. Leonardo da Vinci, Mona Lisa. Sfumato is Italian for smoky. It's a smoky-like haziness that subtly softens the outlines in paintings. You may have heard of the Mona Lisa or have seen it in pop culture, movies, on clothing. Why is the Mona Lisa so famous? Here's some facts. She has her own room in the Louvre Museum in Paris. Although in the art world, the painting had always been an acknowledged masterpiece, it wasn't until it was stolen in the summer of 1911 that it would capture the attention of the general public. Newspapers spread the story of the crime worldwide. When the painting finally returned to the Louvre two years later, practically the whole world was cheering. Since the painting first arrived at the Louvre in 1815, Mona Lisa has received plenty of love letters and flowers from admirers. She even has her own mailbox. Here's a link to a video that explains additional facts about why the Mona Lisa is so famous. The art historian and art critic Giorgio Vasari identified the woman as Lisa Giardini. She was about 25 years old when she posed for Leonardo. We're not sure of her social status because there's no jewelry and no attributes associated with wealth on her clothing, 
our face, our neck. Leonardo's goal was to create a convincing representation of the individual. Among the aspects which remain unclear are the exact identity of the sitter, who commissioned the portrait, how long Leonardo worked on the painting, how long he kept it, and how it came to be in the French royal collection. In the background is a mysterious uninhabited landscape. The original painting is darker today than 500 years ago, making the color less vivid. Leonardo also used atmospheric perspective. Our next artwork is Michelangelo's David. The account of the battle between David and Goliath is told in Book 1 of Samuel. Saul and the Israelites are facing the Philistines near the valley of Elab. Twice a day for 40 days, Goliath, the champion of the Philistines, comes out between the lines and challenges the Israelites to send out a champion of their own to decide the outcome in single combat. Only David, a young shepherd, accepts the challenge. Saul reluctantly agrees and offers his armor, which David declines since it is too large, taking only his sling and five stones from a brook. David and Goliath thus confront each other. Goliath with his armor and shield, David armed only with his rock, his sling, his faith in God, and his courage. David hurls a stone from his sling with all his might, and it hits Goliath in the center of his forehead. Goliath falls on his face to the ground, and David then cuts off his head. We still see the Greco-Roman influence, specifically from the Hellenistic period, which was concerned with emotion. Michelangelo worked constantly for two years on this sculpture. He was only 26 years old in the year 1501, but he was already the most famous and best paid artist in his days. He accepted the challenge with enthusiasm to sculpt a large scale David and worked constantly for over two years to create one of his most breathtaking masterpieces of gleaming white marble. The slingshot he carries over his shoulder is almost invisible, emphasizing that David's victory was one of cleverness not sheer force. He transmits exceptional self-confidence and concentration, both values of the thinking man considered perfect during the Renaissance. Luca, a herbalist and diarist living nearby, wrote down the exceptional event of the transport in his chronicles. It was midnight, May the 14th, and the giant was taken out of the workshop. They even had to tear down the archway so huge he was. Forty men were pushing the large wooden cart where David stood, protected by ropes, sliding it through town on trunks. The giant eventually got to Signora Square on June 8, 1504, where it was installed next to the entrance to the Palazzo, replacing Donatello's bronze sculpture of Judith and Holofernes. Vasari, a great admirer of Michelangelo, extolled the work, claiming, Without any doubt, Michelangelo's David has put in the shade every other statue, ancient or modern, Greek or Roman. The statue was intended as a symbol of liberty in front of Florence's city hall, signifying that just as David had protected his people and governed them justly, so whoever ruled Florence should vigorously defend the city and govern it with justice. The proportions of some details are typical of Michelangelo's work. The figure has an unusually large head and imposing right hand. These elements may be due to the fact that the statue was originally intended to be placed in the cathedral roof line, on the cathedral roof line. 
So important parts of the sculpture had to be necessarily accentuated in order to be visible from below. Now let's look at Raphael's School of Athens. This is one of the most important painting commissions that Julius II awarded. In particular, Raphael's fresco, The School of Athens, has come to symbolize the marriage of art, philosophy, and science that was a hallmark of the Italian Renaissance. The two thinkers in the very center, Aristotle on the right and Plato on the left pointing up, have been enormously important to Western thinking generally and in different ways, their different philosophies were incorporated into Christianity. Plato points up because in his philosophy, the changing world that, was, that we see around us is just a shadow of higher, truer reality that is eternal and unchanging and include things like goodness and beauty. For Plato, this otherworldly reality is the ultimate reality and the seat of all truth, beauty, justice, and wisdom. Aristotle holds his hand down because in his philosophy, the only reality is the one that we can see and experience by sight and touch. Exactly the reality dismissed by Plato. Aristotle's ethics the book that he holds emphasizes the relationship between justice, friendships, and government of the human world and the need to study. Pythagoras on the lower left believed that the world, including the movement of the planets and stars, operated according to mathematical laws. These mathematical laws were related to ideas of musical and cosmic harmony, and thus, for the Christians who interpreted him in the Renaissance, to God. Pythagoras taught that each of the planets produced a note as it moved, based on its distance from the earth. Together, the movement of all the planets were perfect harmony, the harmony of the spheres. Euclid is bent over, demonstrating something with the compass. His young students eagerly try to grasp the lessons he's teaching them. The Greek mathematician is known as the father of geometry, and his love of concrete theorems with exact answers demonstrates why he represents Aristotle's side of the School of Athens. Experts believe that Euclid is a portrait of Raphael's friend, Bramante. The great mathematician and astronomer Ptolemy is right next to Euclid. With his back to the viewer, wearing a yellow robe, he holds a terrestrial globe in his hand. It's thought that the bearded man standing in front of him holding a celestial globe is the astronomer Zoroaster. Interestingly, the young man standing next to Zoroaster, peeking out at the viewer, is none other than Raphael himself. Incorporating this type of self-portrait is not unheard of at the time, though it was a bold move for the artist to incorporate his likeness into a work of such intellectual complexity. It is universally agreed that the older gentleman sprawled on the steps is Diogenes. Founder of the Cynic philosophy, he was a controversial figure in his day living a simple life and criticizing cultural conventions. Here is a close-up of Raphael's self-portrait. The School of Athens is one of the four wall frescoes. This room was set to be Julius's library and therefore Raphael's overall concept balances the contents of what would be would have been in the Pope's study. In the 15th century, a tradition of decorating private libraries with portraits of great thinkers was common. 
Raphael took the idea to a whole new level with massive compositions that reflected philosophy, theology, and literature. Read as a whole, they immediately transmitted the intellect of the Pope and would have sparked discussion between cultural minds that were lucky enough to enter into his private space. Now let's look at 16th century Venetian painting. Venetian painters were among the earliest to use oil painting in Italy. As a result of oil painting, Venetian painters are known for their rich colors. Paintings are also sensuous or sexual. Here we have Titian, Venus of Urbino. Titian elevates to the status of classical mythology what is probably a representation of a sensuous Italian woman in her bedchamber. There is sensuality, as you can see from the softness of her skin. The glazing technique was also used, and the dog was a symbol of fidelity and royalty. We see her gazing directly at us. At the woman's feet is a slumbering lapdog, where Cupid would be if this was Venus. In the right background, near the window, opening onto a landscape, two servants bend over a chest apparently searching for garments. Renaissance household stored clothing and carved wood chest called Kasani to clothe their reclining nude mistress. As in the other Venetian paintings, color plays a prominent role in Venus of Urbino. The red tones on the matron's skirt and the muted reds of the tapestries against the neutral whiteness are something to pay attention to. Here, Titian also set the standard for representations of the reclining female nude, whether divine or mortal, setting up tradition of the reclining nude in Western art history. Here are just a few more examples of that standard. The last style we'll look at is the Mannerist. Mannerist art is deliberately intellectual, asking the viewer to respond in a sophisticated way to the spatial challenges. They have complicated compositions, distorted figures, and complex allegorical interpretations, as well as unusual lighting effects. Mannerism started at the end of the High Renaissance and then was replaced 80 years later by the Baroque. This is Portormos and Two Men of Christ. This painting suggests a whirling dance of the grief stricken. There is no cross visible. The natural world itself also appears to have nearly vanished. Mannerism favors compositional tension and instability rather than the balance and clarity of earlier Renaissance painting. The Virgin, larger than her counterparts, swoons sideways, inviting the support of those behind her. The assembly looks completely interlocked, as if architecturally integrated. Legend has it that Portormo set himself in a self-portrait at the extreme right of the canvas, but ultimately, the most compelling and empathetic figure is the crouching man in the foreground, whose expression mixes with the weight of the cadaver and the weight of melancholy. Thanks for watching everyone.
And here are some additional resources.